In this problem, we'll solve a second-order differential equation involving the motion of a mass spring damper system, but we're also going to do a little bit more. Instead of just plugging this ODE into ODE45 and obtaining the mass's position and velocity, we're going to impose some performance requirements that must be satisfied. We are given this forcing function u of t and other system parameters such as the mass m and spring constant k. We need to find all the damper values c which satisfy these two requirements. Before we do any coding or whatnot, let's think about how to tackle this problem. We know that the purpose of the damper is to remove energy from the system. The damper will eventually force the system to settle to its steady state value. We know that, in general, increasing the C value causes the system to settle to its steady state value more quickly. This isn't actually true after C reaches a certain value, but for the time being, this generalization suffices. If we look at requirement 1, we see that the mass's maximum forward velocity after a certain time must be within this range. It stands to reason that we can find some C value that corresponds to 0.4 meters per second and another C value that corresponds to 0.5 meters per second. More specifically, the C value corresponding to 0.5 meters per second will probably be less than the C value corresponding to 0.4 meters per second because a higher C value means more damping and therefore a lower peak forward velocity. So, we basically need to find some upper C value and some lower C value. I have no clue where to even start guessing. Just from common sense, we know that the lower C value must be at least zero, but that doesn't really help us. However, requirement 2 gives us a bound on the upper value of C. We know that C cannot exceed this quantity 2 times the square root m times k, which comes out to around 115 kilograms per second if you plug in the numbers from here. Although requirement 2 helps us narrow down the range of permissible C values, 0 to 115 is still a very large range. What we can do is repeatedly test a single value of c within 0 to 115 and use the results to help us pick the next c value we test. This process is a hybrid of trial and error and educated guessing. Eventually, we'll whittle down the range of permissible c values to an integer, such as c equals 70 to 82 kilograms per second. Then, we can refine our range even more into the decimal places, such as c equals 70.12, to 82.34 kilograms per second. With that plan of attack in mind, let's go ahead and start solving the problem. Here we are in MATLAB. I wrote a skeleton script file which contains some parameters, a bunch of plotting code, and a custom subfunction at the very bottom which we're going to get to in a little bit. The first thing you might notice is this commented out tick statement at the very top. If you sandwich a code segment with the word tick at the start and talk at the end, MATLAB will actually return how long it takes for that code segment to run. We'll be utilizing this later on, which is why the tick statement is currently commented out. Right below that, we have some parameters which hopefully look familiar by now. We have things like the spring constant, the initial conditions, and the simulation time vector. I also made variables representing the lower and upper velocity limits after t1, which come from the first requirement. Finally, we have the options variable, which tightens the accuracy of ODE45. The first thing we need to do is figure out how to represent the forcing function u of t. We're told that u of t starts out at some value f1, decreases linearly until u of t equals 0, and then just stays at 0 for the remainder of the time duration. This is a piecewise continuous function, so we can express it using the heaviside function. The first part of this piecewise function is just the diagonal line. The slope of the line is negative f1 over t1, and the y-intercept is f1 up here, so the equation of the line is just u of t equals negative f1 over t1 times t plus f1. The second part of the piecewise function is just u of t equals 0. Recall that a two-part piecewise continuous function takes the form f1 of t until time t equals t switch, and then f2 of t for all times after t switch. We can represent f of t using the notation on the screen. You take the first part and add it to the difference between parts multiplied by the step function shifted by t switch. So to apply it to our problem, the forcing function u of t can be written as shown. Let's program that into MATLAB. 
and we get the graph that's shown in the problem statement. The next step is to write some code that will test a single damping value. More specifically, we need to call the mck function to obtain the mass's velocity, then we need to check if the velocity after t1 is within the allowable range. I defined a variable which stores the max c value as stipulated by requirement 2. I made the c test variable, which will be used to test different individual c values. Right now, I just set c test equals to c max as a placeholder. Then I called the mck function I wrote in a previous video. If you don't have this function, you can find the link to it in the video description. We can ignore the first output of the mck function since the output time vector of the function will be identical to the t vector we are passing into the function. We are more interested in the x and v vectors, but we need to do some additional processing. We need to obtain the peak velocity after time equals t1, so we need to write a few more lines of code. Rather than doing that all up here, I wrote a subfunction at the bottom of the script which checks if both requirements are met. This function is called check requirements. It accepts the t and v vectors, the two velocity thresholds as stipulated by requirement 1, the c value we are testing, and the max allowable c value from requirement 2. It returns r1 met and r2 met, which are boolean flags indicating whether each requirement is met. It also returns a variable representing the max peak velocity after time t1. You can read all of this in the documentation below. To check whether requirement 1 is met, we need to extract all the velocities after time t1. The first line here can be kind of convoluted, so let's break it down from the inside out. The statement t is greater than t1 produces a logical vector with zeros in spots where t is less than or equal to t1 and ones in spots where t is greater than t1. When that logical vector is used to index the v vector, the elements of v in the same indices as ones in the logical vector are retained. Therefore, the statement v of t is greater than t1 returns a vector with all the velocities after time t1. Then, we just slap the max function over all of that to extract the peak value. Note that the problem only requires us to obtain the peak forward velocity, so we don't need to take the absolute value of the v vector. The peak negative velocity can exceed the thresholds, but we don't really care about that in this problem. The second line is hopefully more straightforward. It just checks if the peak velocity after t1 falls within the specified bounds. The fprintf statements print the information to the command window. We can do something similar for the second requirement. This completes the check requirements subfunction. To reiterate, I wrote this subfunction so we can call it repeatedly rather than copying and pasting a bunch of code whenever we change our c value. This will be very important later on. I'm going to uncomment the fprintf statements, but after I do that, I'm going to go back to where we branched off. This is where we left off. We set c test equals to c max and called the mck function. We can now call the check requirements function. The plotting code I just uncommented produces this plot. 
The bottom subplot contains horizontal lines representing the acceptable velocity band and a vertical line designating when T1 occurs. The peak forward velocity after T1 needs to lie within these bands, which it obviously doesn't for our current value of C test. This is also verified in the command window. This is a good stopping point. To recap, we introduced the problem statement, planned our problem solving strategy, and began implementing the solution in MATLAB. In the next video, we'll continuously test out different C values until we can find a somewhat coarse range of acceptable C values. Then, we'll refine the range by performing what's called a sweep test. See you next time.